praise God. You know, the word teaches that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. You don't overcome by one. They go together. So if you don't apply the word and testify about the word, you aren't an overcomer according to the word. You overcome by the blood of the Lamb, what Jesus sacrificed, and the word of your testimony. That happens in the midst of a testimony. That happens after a testimony. That's why it's important to agree with what the word says in the midst of a test or a trial, not just after. Amen or oh no? So, we say about ourselves what God says about us. It doesn't matter if people look at us and go, well, we know you, that's not true. But you know what? I'm in process, you're in process, and this is what my Father says, and I believe Him. And there is a power of God that's at work in all of us. The, ki the kingdom of God and the power of God is at work within us. And I I'm convinced that we really don't understand the power of God. We can talk about the dunamis, the kratos, you know, all these different facets of the power of God. But, but you, you know... We underestimate the power of God. Especially faced with a circumstance, we think, well, you know, this might be a little tough for God. Well, there's nothing tough for God. It's tough for us. But it's already accomplished in God. He said, it's, I mean, on the cross, Jesus said, it's finished. That means everything you'll ever pace has already been taken care of. It's finished. What you say about it makes the difference. We're not here to win victories. We're here to enforce a victory that's already won. There is a difference. And we've got to get that in our hearts. And you know, this has been an interesting year. And I, as I've been studying, I've been discovering some things in the, in the, in the scriptures and, and having different experiences with God that are just awe-inspiring to me. And I, I'm going to share one passage of scripture and then a testimony and then we'll... We'll, we'll see where God takes us. In Luke 7, 11, it says, And it came to pass the day after that Jesus went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Now when he came near to the gate of the city, behold, <clears throat> there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother. and She was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Weep not. And he came and touched the briar, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto you, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying, That a great prophet is risen among us, and that God has visited his people. Now, you know, cursory inspection of this for years, I, I would read over this and think, Wow, God's powerful. He raises the dead. But, you know, I formed a picture. I mean, here's this widowed mother. He's probably a teenage kid. The only son, you know, everybody's weeping. And it's, it's a terrible thing. And, you know, but Jesus has compassion on her destitution and her loss and meets her at the point of her need. Well, I never really studied and researched this until this year. And I was absolutely blown away. Because I had presupposed certain things that have no basis in truth. And I want to share a couple of those things with you. When you carefully study this account, you discover some things that don't mesh with the assumptions we've had over the years. For instance, the gate of the city. Do you know that Nain was an unwalled city? There was no gate. How does that happen? It says, another statement, there were much people with her. The word translated people by the King James translators was actually a Phoenician word that meant, spoke of an armed horde or a military escort. Hmm. Then we see, we, we see this, he touched the briar. You know, that, that word briar was a Latin word that described a ceremonial burial platform on which a sarcophagus, sarcophagus would rest. It was only used for ceremonial burials. That was not a normal funeral. This was a funeral procession. It was a ceremony that was taking place. So wait a minute. Who is this young man? Well, you see, the word, the, the expression young man in the Greek actually has to do with an honorific that you would speak to a Roman soldier. So here's the picture. 
We have a military funeral processional coming out of the garrison of Nain. And they're headed towards this burial ground. Well, that was interesting enough, but then I kept going. Nain was a Roman military garrison that spawned a town. It was located in the Galilee near the northern border of Samaria on the Roman Imperial Military Highway called the Augustan Way. Non-military traffic was allowed on the highway by paying a large transit toll to the Romans. What happened is the garrison of Nain, you have the Augustan Way, there's a point where there was a road that branched off and went a mile that way, and at the end of the mile was the garrison. Where those two roads intersected, there was like a toll booth. That, that's what they called the gate. Had nothing to do with walls. So you had to pay a large fee to the Roman soldiers in that garrison every time you traversed that roadway. Whole different story. This, okay, now I've got to say this. Emperor Tiberius, you know, was a military man. He declared that speckle, speckle, special, I've been looking at this. Do you know the first, I've got to say this because I told Reshma, the very first Rosh Hashanah supernatural encounter I had with Jesus, the room was like that in the spirit. Softly falling gold dust that looked like snow. So, I mean, that... That's cool to me. So where was I? Tiberius was a military man, and he declared that special recognition would be given to Roman soldiers who had been killed in action. Generally, Roman soldiers killed in action were cremated in the region, region that they were killed. But under Tiberius, every 100th officer, so now we know he's an officer, who had been killed was honored with an elaborate state ceremony and burial. Once a year, the emperor declared a day of tribute wherein an officer was ceremoniously buried and special recognition was given to the soldiers who died while serving in their four regions, Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Each of the four ceremonies was directed by a Roman senator and featured an imperial burial procession called Caesar's Processional of Honor. These processionals included members of the emperor's personal guard, two priests from Rome, two local religious priests, the officer's family members, and hundreds of soldiers and various dignitaries. You could only come to that processional by invite. Now you have to understand that no community, you could not talk. Once that started, not a word could be spoken it could not be interrupted. You could not touch anything in that. If you did, it was an immediate death sentence right there on the spot. Those ceremonial guards would kill you. That's the picture we're looking at. Although it's even more than this. Here's how it happened. The preparation for this day of tribute began 30 days before the ceremony. The body of the dead officer was prepared. This included the removal of the brain, the spinal cord, the heart, the lungs, the tongue, the eyes, and the liver. They were embalmed in a special mixture of spices and honey and herbs. They were put in a brass urn and the senator would take that urn before the processional and carry it. Hmm. Then they would take the body of this Roman officer and they would drain the blood after they had removed everything and they would do this process of special herbs and spices and, and embalm him. He was pickled. Then they would dress him in the finest garb. They would put him on a gold briar, gold and, and silver briar, very heavy, and in a marble sarcophagus. 
If you weren't there when the funeral procession began, you couldn't come. Now, it was just historically a couple of months earlier that Jesus had healed this Roman senator. So here comes Jesus. He arrived too late. He comes. He sees the processional clearing, just clearing the checkpoint. And Jesus saw the weeping mother of the dead soldier, and he says he was moved with compassion. So he walked up and he said, woman, don't weep. Death sentence. He touched the briar. Death sentence. He stopped the whole processional. And he spoke to this man without a brain, without a spinal cord, without a heart, without a liver, without lungs. Come forth. And he came up out of that marble sarcophagus. You see, I, I, I sometimes think in the church, over-familiarity breeds contempt. We gloss over some of these stories because, oh yeah, we've heard this before. But you see, when you really begin to look at this God that we call our Savior, our Lord, you begin to discover things that are way beyond anything we've ever conceived of. Yeah, I've been convinced before. I'm even more convinced now. My God can do anything. Anything. He's in the business of doing anything. Interrupting lives that seem devastated and destroyed. And breathing new life into a death situation. You know, sharing testimonies. Bill Johnson says it this way. The... The, we overcome by the blood of the lad and the word of our testimony. And when we speak, testimony is like prophecy. When you speak forth your testimony, you actually impregnate the atmosphere with the potential of that very thing taking place in another individual's lives. All they have to do is agree and say, God, I know you can do that for me too. And so testimonies impregnate the atmosphere with a potential. That's why they're so powerful. It was a testimony that caused Reshma's mother to say, you know what, I will try that God. She, oh, she prayed, she was stirred up, but she heard what had happened to her cousin's sister-in-law, and she said, you know what, I'm going to try. So the potential became the reality when she agreed with it. I agree with God's Word. You know, there's things... I still gloss up. I mean, there, all of us do this. We read the Word and take things for granted. But we can't. We cannot. He's bigger than anything we have ever conceived of. Now, you know, this year on Rosh Hashanah, I'm going to give a quick testimony. For the last 14 years now, I've had a visitation on that Hebrew New Year, Rosh Hashanah, sometimes September, sometimes October. These next four years are going to be crazy. I mean, with you've got blood moons on the Tetrad happening on certain feast days. This has never happened to this extent. It's happened, but not to this extent with Kamad Aysan, all the signs in the heavens and the earth. Anyway, so in this, this visitation, we were ministering in Albuquerque, New Mexico. First night, I saw, first day, I saw Jesus standing next to the table as we were visiting with the pastor, just getting to know him. That night, he came in, and we he shared some things. And the second night, he, while I was in worship, I saw this being come in. Now, I've got to define being for you, because in heaven, there are creatures that are before the throne of God, living beings that we can't, some of them we can identify, some of them we've never seen on the earth. So there are other. But I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about this being that looks like a horse, but is far beyond what we think a horse is because it has tremendous intelligence, wisdom, compassion, love, all the attributes that are in God. Every being in heaven has that. But this thing has tremendous wisdom, and I, I can't even describe it. I saw him walking into the room over off to my left, way on the other side of the room, and I looked. First thing you do when you have an encounter, did Jesus Christ come in the flesh? You test every spirit, every vision, everything, every time. 
If they cannot give an assenting, yes, he did, then you know what? I bind you. Get out of here. But this being acknowledged Jesus Christ came in the flesh and he was Lord. When that was done, he communicated. I love communication in heaven. We don't have to talk and have words that are, we're, we can't find, like I just did. It's, it's instant, heart to heart. No miscommunication. He said, mount up, let's go. See, I got my cowboy boots on. I'm ready again. <laughs> and again, you know, what's interesting about this, there's no bridle or harness. You don't control anything in heaven. They're, the bond is love. You don't have to fear falling off. You don't even have to hold on because pff, you're knit together by common, uh, a common thing. That's the love of God. So there, there's no fear of that even. So I got on board and we took off. And I mean, I'd like to say he galloped, but you know, you'd, I don't know. We just took off. Way out into the stars. Heard all of creation singing the, the glory of God. That's quite a symphony. And at some point we stopped. I heard dismount. I stood there. And I'm just, I mean, I'm looking at the creation of God. I'm just in awe. And I looked off into the distance in this double door. I mean, it was rounded at the top. Portal opened. And out came Jesus on another being that looked like a white horse, but he had the crown on his head. He had a sword coming out of his mouth. He was the king of glory that was about to return to earth. And he came up a distance from me, and he dismounted and called me over, and I walked over. And he began to communicate that time on earth is wrapping up very quickly, quicker than most Christians are aware of. He said, as a matter of fact, I'm coming so soon that my people are not only not aware, they're not ready, but I'm coming anyway. And then he pointed off in the distance and I looked and I saw the host of heaven all mounted coming towards the earth. And he said, you tell my people it's time to get their house in order and their lives in order because I'm coming sooner than, sooner than they think. I said, yes, sir. Well, one thing I'd heard some years ago, how many of you know who Lester Summerall was? Lester Summerall was a, a, a tremendous man. I, I, you know, my dad ministered with him. And, uh, but Lester Summerall, about 25, 30 years before he went home to be with the Lord, if you haven't heard how he went home to be with the Lord, it's an awesome story. God told him he'd give him a sign. That's when he was going. He called his family, said, I've got to go. I bless you, and laid down, left. But anyway, the Lord told Lester, he said, 30, uh, 30 years before it happened, he said, when you start seeing... Alternate lifestyles come out of the closet, I'm at the door. When you see bestiality taking place, I'm not standing at the door anymore, I'm coming through. I won't tolerate that again. So, hey, please. But, and I could tell you a couple testimonies that have corroborated that, that this has already taken place, but here's the one we just heard. In Germany, they have opened a hotel, legalized, bestiality. It's, it's beyond disgusting, but I said, thank God he's coming home back. You see, we have to be a people that knows our God, knows the word of God. We should be quick to share our testimony because time is short. And, and, and there's people that are, uh, you know, I love this Timothy. Paul told Timothy, I want you to be an example to who first? The believers. You know, I used to read that and get confused until I hung around church people for a while. I said, yeah, the ones that need most of, uh, uh, the most godly example is the church. But we have to be aware of what God is speaking and saying. There, there is a shortness of time. There is an urgency in the heavens. I mean, all of heaven is just, the cloud of witnesses is saying, come on, come on, wake up, come on. They're cheering us on, but they're also pleading with us. And they're interceding for us. To wake up to the hour in which we are living in. There are many more testimonies yet to take place in this earth before he returns. My question to you tonight is, are you going to be somebody that helps to provoke a testimony in someone else? Or are you just going to sit around and wait? That'll be a testimony too, but it won't be a good one. It won't hold weight in heaven. There's much to be done. There's little time to do it. And I really, I mean, I've had an urgency in my spirit anyway, but that encounter, 
I don't say I'm frantic because I'm not. I'm at rest, but I, that's, that's the only way I can describe, like, oh, come on. Come on, church. That's why I like to see churches that are alive and doing something in the marketplace, in the world, not just, you know, our four walls, a secret society of secluded saints. It's time for us to stand up now. Amen? Hallelujah. I don't like to say that, but I'm going to say it anyway. God is good. And that's why I don't like to say that, because you know what? We say all the time, but then we complain. So I never say all the time, because I'm not going to indict myself. That I'm just being facetious. The truth is, He is good all the time. But we actually have to believe that, even in the midst of the hurt and the pain and the sorrow and the struggle. God, I, I'm suffering, but you're good. I love you. That's the mark of maturity. What's your name, sir? Lo Lo really? Okay. Lolly. Lolly, I, I see around you, there's a, there's a lot of, there has been a lot of chaos, a lot of things happening. And, and, You've almost come to the place of standstill because you're just so distracted and, dear God, what do I do? I, I mean, it's, it's like nonstop attack. But the Lord says, in the midst of that, look up. Because the answer is right there. He says, it's time for you to come to the end of your own intellect and your own understanding. You're a guy that likes to figure things out and have it just so. But God says, stop that, because the way he's going to see you through this season is going to be something other than you could ever figure out. And if you grab that now, if you say, okay, God, I'm, uh, you're God, I'll, I'll let you do this, you'll come through it very quickly now. But you can stay in that place where everything's happening because you're going to try and figure it out and work it out. You need a strategy from heaven right now. Your family needs you to get that strategy from heaven. Not just right there. I'm talking about your extended family. Because it's affecting many more than you know. But God wants to give you that breakthrough now because He wants you to not only have a testimony of the goodness of God, He wants you to have a revelation of the goodness of God. You've had some, you've had some some things happen in your life that you've seen the hand of God move, but then you go, you started saying, well, where are you now, God? He hasn't moved. You have. But your breakthrough is right in front of you. So, Father, I just pull down confusion. Every wicked work. Father, past generational blindness and curses that would try and thwart your purposes and the destiny that he's called to fulfill, he and his family. We cast it down tonight in the name of Jesus. And Father, we release revelation and breakthrough in Jesus' name. Now you're going to find something out. You're going to have rest and sleep. Not tossing and turning and fretting, but sleep. Real deep sleep. Because God, and, and you too, Mrs. Because God's going to set you free. It's time to come in to the fullness of what he's called you to. Amen. <laughs> I like that. And that dark cloud is gone. <laughs> How many of you know God loves you? Really? How many of you question if God really loves you? I want to... Come on, let's be honest. You've never questioned that. I still do that sometimes. God, you know, you say you love me, but... Well, guess what? God loves you. He loves you more than you can comprehend. <laughs>